Okay, we're in Misano Adriatico uh, at the Cetra Seminar in 2004. Today is the 9th. It's the 9th, yeah. 9th of September 2004, Professor Michael Cronin from City University in Dublin. Michael, tell me, for those of us who don't want to buy your most recent book, what's the relation between translation and globalization? I think the first thing that made me write up to the book, Translation and Globalization, was an impatience with the fact that in translation studies there was an assumption that the economy, society, that the world um, hadn't much changed uh, since the, the late 19th century in terms of how uh, translation activity was practiced, the kind of context in which translation activity was practiced. So the, the first thing that I do in translation and globalization is try to describe a political economy of uh, translation activity. In other words, what I'm doing is looking at the kinds of ways in which global economy and society has changed, particularly with the rise of the notion of informationalism and the information uh, society. And what the consequences then are for translation, translation studies, uh, if we have information moving through these kind of global uh, spaces, but moving, of course, in a multilingual world. So that's the, the first thing the book attempts to do, is to provide um, this uh, political economy. The second thing that translation and globalization does is that it tries to treat non-literary translation as uh, an object of uh, study from the point of view of uh, cultural uh, studies. In other words, it seems to, to me to date that much of the very political uh, readings of translation or the, the hermeneutic studies had very often been directed at literary uh, translation with the odd nod to what was happening in scientific, economic or, or pragmatic uh, translation. So what I try to do in, the, in this book is, is to offer the same kind of interpretive and philosophical and hermeneutic complexity and political uh, awareness or sensitivity, but use it to uh, look at pragmatic translation, which of course is the vast bulk uh, or majority of translations that are produced in the world uh, today. So that's the second big uh, goal of uh, translation and globalization. And the third element in the book is that it's an attempt to talk to other disciplines. When I was writing um, the book, I was drawing on political science, I was drawing on uh, economics, I was drawing on anthropology, I was drawing on uh, psychology, I was drawing on organization uh, theory, uh, theories of, of, of networking and, and so on. And to some extent, what I'm trying to do in, in the book is establish links between these different disciplines and translation studies, but also that the traffic can go the other way. In other words, that a student of political science, a student of economics, a student of anthropology can read translation and globalization and see where translation activity uh, fits into what's happening on uh, the planet at present, and more particularly the ways in which uh, forms of translation uh, activity uh, make uh, richer, deeper, more complex uh, theories or visions or versions of globalization. Can you give an example of something in that way? The, one of the things that um, I was uh, extremely interested in was uh, network uh, theory. In, in other words, the, the notion that as you move to uh, an informational uh, society with um, communication and telecommunications networks and so on, that the notion of distance changes dramatically. In other words, that distance is defined by where you are on the network rather than where you are, if you like, spatially or, or geographically. In other words, that um, if you are not connected on a network to the person next door, they might as well be as far away from you 
as if they were living on the other side of the globe. And that works, of course, in the, uh, the other way. Now, this notion of uh, networking and the notion of proximity and distance, which the experience of translators have all the time now, of uh, working for clients sometimes on the other side of the, the globe, led me on to a second idea from networking theory, which was what's called first order and second order exchanges. Um, first order exchanges are very kind of brief, uh, instantaneous, quick uh, connections or links with uh, another person or uh, entity. Second order exchanges are multidimensional, they're complex, and they are durational. They, they last through uh, time. One of the uh, difficulties in the contemporary world that you know, we economists and political scientists and all that have to, to contend with is the fact that the logic of uh, ICT is pushing first order exchanges, but in a multilingual world, you need second order exchanges. What I mean by that is that you oh, need. Wait, 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 wait. ICT? Oh, sorry, uh, inf inf information uh, communication and uh, technology. I'm um, not um, so that the, the use of uh, information uh, technology encourages the first order exchange, but it needs, in a multilingual setting, second order exchanges. In other words, it needs people who can invest uh, large amounts of time in the slow, painstaking task of uh, acquiring a language or uh, languages. So those are the translators? Yes, they are the translators. And one of the paradoxes of the contemporary situation is that translators must allow people the illusion of a world of first order exchanges, hence the role of localization. But that is only possible if we have second order uh, exchanges. Um, so this is where, so making people aware of the existence of those a different order of exchanges is, uh, is important. Is, it, is that helpful for translators, do you think, this, this kind of work? I do you think, think you're going to be read by translators and they're going to improve their practice at all? Or is that not the aim at all? No, one of the um, explicit aims of the book is to make translators aware, and particularly the vast majority of translators who work as pragmatic translators, work as sci work in scientific, technical, uh, commercial, and other texts, who, who work in, in uh, various areas of the localization industry, that what they are doing is sociologically, politically, economically uh, complex and in, in important. To, to try and show to them the very real links between uh, what they do and what's happening in, in the contemporary uh, world. That, they're, they're, that their activity is not somehow kind of marginal or peripheral or uh, irrelevant to what uh, the major changes that have gone on are still going on. Would you describe your approach in general as being a cultural studies approach? It's a cultural studies um, approach that is somewhat skeptical of cultural studies approaches, if I could put it that way. Right, well, uh, how, how would you describe your approach then? Um, I, th I think I would describe my uh, approach as one that is primarily concerned with um, political uh, questions. I mean, the reason I, I, I say that, make a distinction with cultural studies, is that I think sometimes cultural studies for me uh, in, involves a, a complete kind of aestheticization of the, the political a concern you know, with aesthetic texts and, 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 and so on. And that I almost prefer a kind of a bolder uh, description of, of, of what I do, um, which is that of the, uh, the, the political. I'm very interested and concerned with the, the political implications of what we do as translators. Yeah, I like the political economics. It's a 19th century science. That, that it's exactly, that is 21st century relevance. Okay. How did you get to this point? What's, no, 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 let, let me ask really specifically. When you were 23 or 24 or 25, where were you doing? What were you studying? What were you writing? When I was um, 23, I was finishing up my second year as a language assistant in France. I was teaching one of the uh, Conseil Col, the Lecteur d'Anglais. And 
at the time I was considering doing a master's degree in linguistics, returning to Ireland doing a master's degree in uh, linguistics, um, started to read in the, uh, the area. But very quickly, um, I found that I was much more attracted to areas that I was just beginning to, 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 to know, but that I in fact came to through linguistics, which was, was translation studies, which particularly because of um, Susan Bassnett's work and the cultural turn and then the, um, the translation scholars in the 1970s, the, um, the, the polysystems people, I suddenly became aware of the fact that it was possible to look at um, language and languages in a very different way from the way in which I previously thought about or experienced translation, which was the very much uh, the old uh, paradigm of uh, translation as a form of language teaching in the modern language uh, curriculum. When I went on to do my PhD, which was on um, prose fiction in, uh, in Quebec, um, when I was looking at, and I was using a notion of play and game as a way of understanding things that were happening in the work of two Quebec novelists, Réjean Duchamp and Gérard Bessette, uh, I became increasingly interested in the relationship between the French and the English languages in their, their texts and the way in which thinking about translation was a way of thinking about uh, what they were uh, doing. And this in turn then uh, reawakened my uh, experiences growing up in a bilingual environment with, with Irish, Gaelic and uh, English. And of course it was the movement outwards that began to make me think again about uh, what had been happening uh, inwards. And so it was that kind of interest then that led me to write my first book, uh, Translating Ireland, where... That, that's not your doctoral thesis for Quebec? Yes. Not your, that was, was that published? Uh, parts were published as academic articles, but uh, not, as, not in a book form. Um, so, I mean, the very, very first book that was published was a, was a co-edited book on uh, Irish uh, tourism, but the first monograph that I wrote yeah. was this Translating uh, Ireland book in 1996, uh, where what I was trying to, to show or demonstrate was that um, translation was an extremely powerful way of understanding a lot of the things that had happened in the very difficult and, and fractious history of uh, Ireland. And if you like, it was a way of looking at the, the history which hadn't been uh, used before. And this, so this if you like, was uh, to some extent, it was uh, the movement outwards that brought me uh, inwards. But of course, this then brought me uh, out again in my next book, Across the Lines, travel uh, languages translation where you know I leave Ireland I, I consider uh, many other uh, countries and the, the role of translation in travel uh, writing because I was um, flabbergasted that uh, something that would seem to be to be such a central feature of the experience of travelers uh, right down through the centuries had been so little commented on in the critical literature on uh, travel writing, so the role of languages and translation. So Across the Lines was an attempt to do two things. One was to look at the travel writer as translator, and the other was to look at the translator as a kind of writer traveling, as a kind of traveling uh, writer. And this, of course, I was uh, also trying to link to my interests in tourism. In other words, that in the contemporary world where more people are on the move uh, than ever before for the purposes of leisure uh, tourism, uh, who are traveling to further and uh, for more distant places and therefore are coming to contact uh, potentially, I say potentially, with more and more languages. Um, how does translation uh, fit into that picture? Okay. And then the, the next book would be the globalization book. Next book is the, the, the globalization book, which I, which I just described there uh, a few minutes ago. So where, where do you go from here, or what do you see more generally as the kind of research we need in the near future in translation studies? I would like to see translation very much uh, involved in debates which 
are currently uh, raging around uh, the notion of the multicultural, the notion of the intercultural, the notion of the, the transcultural. Um, and it also brings in certain debates around the notion of the uh, cosmopolitan. Um, in other words, if you take, for example, the continent of, of Europe, um, the extent of uh, population movement, of uh, net uh, immigration, which due to the age profile in Europe is going to become more and more uh, a feature of various societies on, on the continent. If you think of what's been happening in the States and in Latin America, various parts of, of Africa, Southeast Asia and Australasia. Um, the way in which we are going to deal um, with uh, dramatically enhanced multilingualism uh, and multi-ethnicity in our societies is absolutely urgent, it seems to me, as, uh, as a political and sociological task. And it seems to me that translation studies should be in that debate. Uh, in other words, if we take the kind of map that uh, Susan Bassett pointed to at one stage where she said in the, the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, you had the kind of the cultural turn in uh, translation studies. She says that more recently you've had um, the translation turn in uh, cultural studies. So cultural turn in translation studies and then the translation turn in cultural studies. I think that what we need now is uh, the transcultural or intercultural turn in uh, translation studies because it does seem to me that we've got very important things to say in the discipline um, for debates that are um, very, very live, uh, very difficult, very contentious, very controversial debates uh, in many, many countries uh, throughout the world. So this whole notion of what I call the translational uh, politics of immigration is, I think, going to be right at the heart and should be at the heart of our concerns in the years to come. Good. Professor Crowe, thank you very much. Thank you.